Hello, my name is Tucker Johnson, and I am your host today as we experience NIMSY Live, where we talk about the latest and greatest in translation, localization, internationalization, culturalization, and all that fun stuff global companies need to delight their international <coughs> customers. On this program, we invite guests who like to have fun and have some value to add for our audience of globalization professionals. I'm always eager to provide a platform to those with a good story or a good data set. So let us know if there's any topics you'd like covered or guests we should reach out to for future episodes. If you haven't already done so, make sure that you are subscribing to Nimsy Insights. You can follow us on LinkedIn, X, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel where we archive all of the past episodes here of Nimsy Insights, as well as some very useful workshops that we publish for free out there. So follow us on your platform of choice. Of course, this is a live stream today. And when we do these live streams, the majority of people join us over on LinkedIn. So welcome to the 44 people joining us live on LinkedIn right now. Um, thank you for being here. If you want to ask questions during the, the, the presentation, during the episode today, go ahead and put your comments into the comment section and we'll bring those up on screen and answer them as as they come up so without further ado let's get into it uh, today we are talking about a real application of how a major localization company is partnering with ai to enhance their multimedia localization services as we discuss deluxe's strategic partnership with ai technology leader aptech Deluxe, a major provider of media localization services, has acquired an interest in Aptech and will become the exclusive reseller of Aptech's products to the global media and entertainment industry. We ex we're going to be exploring today how the combined expertise of these two companies will allow them to develop cutting-edge AI solutions to empower translators, voice artists, and other creative professionals. The goal is to leverage AI sensibly to make more diverse content accessible to audiences worldwide, while still keeping human creativity at the center. Deluxe can now offer custom high performance AI tools and integrate directly into customer workflows. This partnership combines Aptech's award-winning R&D with Deluxe's decades of media localization experience. Today we discuss what this partnership means for Deluxe, for Aptech, and for the future of global media distribution and access. Joining us today, we have two guests. Uh, first off, Belen Aguillo Garcia who I used to work with. I had the pleasure <laughs> of working with her before. She's a um, NIMSI alumnus, alumni, alumna. My Latin's not great. Uh, Belen has over a decade of experience in the localization industry, starting in game localization with various roles. She later focused on training, teaching, game localization, and subtitling technologies in a master's program across Europe. While completing her PhD in subtitling for virtual reality content, she took on roles as a lead media researcher and VP of learning at NIMSY Insights. She works as a community builder at Deluxe Media, supporting a global team of over 5,000 freelance subtitlers to enhance their professional growth and ensure top quality experiences. And next up, we have Evgeny Metrosov. Um, Evgeny is a seasoned professional with a passion for advancing the field of machine translation. As the lead science architect at Aptech, he leads a team of experts in developing cutting edge solutions that bridge language barriers. And I love that we have both of you guys today, um, one from Deluxe and one from Aptech so that we can get both sides of the story here. Belen, Evgeny, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tucker. It's so great to be here with you. You know, I missed you. It's like, so a, it's like old times. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Discussing interesting stuff about workflows, language technology, and how it actually makes a difference for clients. So, yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, Let's dive into it. <laughs> I'm excited too. And Evgeny, nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. And I'm great, great to be here. Yeah. Well, I, I want to get right to the chase here. Uh, Deluxe announces strategic AI partnership with Aptech. For those of you listening out there, um, go check it out. There's plenty of press releases out there. Of course, I'm partial to the press releases published at Multilingual Media. So multilingual.com um, gives you all of the nitty gritty details here. But since this is a, a podcast and not a webinar, I'll take this off the screen. And just ask you, um, tell us a little bit about what's going on between Deluxe and Aptech. Sure, I can start with my side of the story and then again can, can add to that. So, I mean, 
basically, well, Deluxe has been using technology for a long time. This is not uh, like a revolution or something absolutely new that is going to change everything. It, absolutely not. We've been using technology for a while, and we've actually been using technology from Uptech for machine translation and transcription for a long time. Um, so we knew what they could offer was uh, cutting edge, state of the art, best technology for specifically subtitling and media and entertainment localization workflows. And with this strategic partnership, well, basically we wanted to strengthen our relationship with Aptec so that we could offer even better services for our clients and <clears throat> really, you know, making use of AI technology. When we talk about AI technology, we're really referring to porno like language technology, right? But now it's saying AI now, but we're talking about language technology, neural machine translation, which I read a, an article from Renato the other day saying yeah. that neural machine translation was the first AI. Oh, technology oh, oh, that's AI. the thing. We've been saying that here at MZ Insights because it's, you know, last year, early 2023, everyone starts talking about AI because ChatGPT comes on the scene and then everything else comes on the scene. And the reality is, AI has been around for a while and what happened in 2023 is it just became more accessible to, you know, the common layperson. I could go in and create a chat GPT account or whatever, but we've been using AI in the language services industry for a while. Um, I, but I'm, inter I'm interested to hear of Genny's thoughts on that. Yes, exactly. And Aptek has been offering uh, the AI or machine learning technology for media and entertainment also for several years already. Um, so we came into this market because uh, traditionally we started with uh, machine translation, then speech recognition came. And this was still like in the early days of uh, rule-based even or statistical approaches to these um, problems. And it's a natural thing if you combine the two to go into the um, media where you have speech signal and you want to transcribe it, you want to translate it properly. And with the introduction of the neural uh, MT and also improvements in speech recognition uh, with neural models, uh, this was really uh, the deal breaker where you say, okay, the quality really has gotten up so much that uh, we can use both technologies quite effectively uh, and we can also go beyond just simple translation and this is what we try to do um, at Uptech uh, to basically try to have models which uh, use some extra knowledge that you can inject into them like I like to say uh, a small uh, representation of the world knowledge that uh, translator has uh, is it is now possible to to be added to the system like information about just simply what what genre it is is it a documentary is it a comedy that you want to translate like information about uh, uh, what style you would like to generate and so on so all of this is now possible to be provided as additional inputs um, in case of our uh, API in case of our offering really is basically just as additional parameters which you can specify and this is what we try to leverage for better customized uh, translation uh, also in partnership with Deluxe. Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah. No, no, go on. No, I, I think one of the cool things about uh, this strategic partnership is that, you know, out there you have technology companies who are doing like great things on on the ai side but they don't really really necessarily understand the workflows and the client needs in media and entertainment specifically so deeply as deluxe and then we have lsps out there who you know are great at the workflows great at at, at um the processes the human in the loop the the, the creative and, and so on and so forth but don't necessarily have a good understanding of what is the technology about what is the what are the limitations of the technology what are the things that you can do in the future to improve the technology and so on and so forth and i think with this partnership that's what we're bringing together to our clients is that we have top-notch researchers uh, all phds from uptech i'm the only one at deluxe but <laughs> we're doing what we can Doctor, uh, uh, sorry I mean, dr Bolin. i forgot to introduce <laughs> you as dr Bolin. 
yeah, yeah. Just kidding. But I mean, we have all these amazing scientists from Aptec now listening to us directly, this, listening to people who have really very practical applications, limitations as well, voicing the needs of our clients. And then Aptec team can really take that and take the feedback from translators, the feedback from the creatives and so on and so forth, and really try to solve those challenges from a science perspective, which is something that I think it's it's missing in the industry right now. And like, we cannot use Google Translate for subtitling because it won't work well. We cannot use generic technology for, for media and entertainment because it's not designed with me media and entertainment in mind. And with this partnership, I, I am really excited because I feel we can really do something cool by combining those two backgrounds and expertise. Yeah. And one thing I've said for years, and usually piss some people off, but in our industry, in general, painting with a broad brush here, language companies suck at technology, and technology <laughs> companies suck at language, right? And that's, you know, no disrespect. I mean, it's kind of a disrespectful statement, but that's why it's great to see partnerships, because deluxe and can focus on language and aptech can focus on the technology and you're merging those together so you got the best of both worlds right um but i i, I realize in my introduction i kind of give a quick introduction um about the companies but i want to talk about deluxe deluxe is not just another lsp and you're the first person from deluxe that i've ever had on on this podcast really i i haven't talked to a lot of people from deluxe if any and throughout my career, because you guys are kind of off doing your own thing, and it's a really cool thing that you're doing. Um, so, Belen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Deluxe does, and then, again, I'm going to ask a little bit about what Aptech does. Yes, of course. Thank you for asking, Tucker. I mean, Deluxe was actually originally founded by William Fox himself, like, more than 100 years ago. So it's a, it's a company with a lot of tradition in the cinema and entertainment industry. Right now, we have a global team of over 4,000 people full-time uh, working in different locations. We, uh, the, the main he headquarters are in Burbank, in Los Angeles, of course, because that's where cinema and all the media uh, entertainment high-quality content is born. Not, not so much today, because now we have more, more content being created in our territories, but that's where, where it was originated. So our headquarters are in, in Burbank. Then we have... Uh, many companies in EMEA in Europe, in, in Spain, in France, in, in Germany, in the UK. And we are also right now working on a very successful and big expansion into APAC. So we have now offices as well in, in Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia. And we also have a, a great team from, from India, from Bangalore, who has been supporting Deluxe for more than 20 years now. So that's basically who we are. And the services that we offer you know, as every other uh, LSP out there, you have to really tailor your service offering to your customers, to your customer base. And it's not just about translation, right? It's every single LSP out there really needs to offer something else because clients are looking for end-to-end -end solutions. They are looking for a partner that can serve them and, you know, remove complexity from already extremely complex and demanding workflows and pipelines. So Deluxe, of course, we have the localization side of the business, which is uh, one of the biggest ones that includes services like subtitling, dubbing, uh, but also accessibility services like closed captions and uh, audio description, uh, which are kind of part of the localization ecosystem, even if they are um, accessibility on, on their own. And then we also have the distribution side of the business, the master fulfillment which is basically adding yet another layer of um, quality assurance to make sure that that not only the translation is correct but you know the final uh, deliverable to the client the final picture audio um, subtitles dubbing everything is perfect and is delivered to the highest of the standards for our clients and also we are in charge of actually delivering that to all the endpoints that clients require require us to do. We have an amazing cinema team for digital distribution. You know, Deluxe originally was a, a traditional film uh, lab industry business, right? But then it changed to digital cinema. And now we have one of the biggest operations for digital cinema distribution ac across the world. So we not, not only make sure that the, the 
the content is properly localized and made accessible for wider audiences around the world, we also make sure that that content reaches the, the, the end users in all the different platforms and endpoints that our clients require, which more and more are becoming even more complex uh, because they have now licensed content for cinema, but then for streaming platform, but they're also for social media, but then also for whatever. So there are many ways where we need to, to put our content for our clients. And it's really very exciting business. Yeah, it sounds like it. That's why I was excited to actually have someone from Deluxe because, I don't know, I think it's cool. I watch movies and then at the end title, I see Deluxe. I'm like, oh, how come I've never actually talked to someone? So, well, thank you, Melon. That provides a lot more clarity. So the, the company, for the local world crowd, that's why we haven't heard of you because you're, you're in Hollywood. You're too cool for us. <laughs> Sorry, too cool yeah. for school. You're down in Hollywood wearing sunglasses and smoking expensive cigarettes while the rest of us are slumming it at Loke World. Um, Evgeny, um, tell us a little bit about Aptek. Yeah. Yeah, Aptek has been around uh, since uh, early 90s or even earlier, actually. So it has a long history, uh, but it always stayed a small to medium sized company. Uh, right now, we have around 100 employees. Uh, the headquarters of Aptek are in McLean, Virginia, so near to Washington, D.C. Um, the original business of Aptek was more in translation services uh, with uh, some government partners, but al also quite early on, some media companies like news uh, wire companies. Um, then, uh, as I said earlier, the speech recognition was added to the portfolio. Later on, also some um, natural language processing in general, uh, like some summarization or ex named entity tagging. And uh, now, of course, this has expanded to using large language models. And uh, we also have a text-to-speech team, which uh, creates great things and which allowed us to go full uh, pipeline speech to speech and uh, work on some dubbing or voiceover technologies. Um, and, uh, yeah, Belen mentioned, uh, our team of, uh, scientists, uh, Aptek traditionally has, uh, great ties to the universities, uh, in the other locations in, uh, Germany, in Aachen, we have a very good technical university here, especially the computer science department, uh, with focus on natural language processing, machine learning. Uh, similarly, in Valencia, we have a small office in Spain, also very close ties to the university there, and some of the best people from both universities already start uh, while doing their uh, graduate studies. Uh, they start working for Aptec, uh, gaining some experience, and a lot of them, um, of course, they are, you know, big, big companies try to, to get, get this, uh, such people, but a lot of these people actually prefer to stay with Uptech and work in a smaller company where they can really make an impact yeah. and directly see the result of their R&D work in uh, real products uh, like the stuff we're doing for Deluxe now. And I think this is really uh, a great motivation to work at Uptech. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, and I, I've heard of Uptech for years, but likewise, I haven't ever really had the opportunity the good fortune to actually talk to someone for Aptech. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, last year, AI, quote unquote, LLM, ChatGB, whatever, right, um, exploded. I'm, I'm interested to hear your take on that because you, you all were doing AI before it was cool. Right. So what what differences have you noticed in what your clients are asking for, who your clients are, what kind of research and development you're prioritizing? How has that shifted over the last few years? I can chime in a little bit and then Eugenie can give sure. a more yeah. scientific and accurate reply to that question. Uh, but one one thing that I think it's worth mentioning regarding that question is that our clients are facing a lot of pressure from executives mm -hmm. due to chat GPT, right? Yeah. I mean, some old man is creating so much disruption. The, the, because the COO it, goes to a conference and hears about it and then comes back yeah. and says, we need chat GPT. Exactly. COOs, uh, CTOs, yeah. uh, executives from all companies. And now they are all saying, why aren't we leveraging this? 
why aren't we solving all the localization problems already with this technology because it's so cool and everyone is talking about it so i think um from from a service provider perspective how we are trying to face this um issue or this challenge is by partnering with our clients and really give them realistic and uh, you know sensible information about really what ai yeah. or neural machine translation asr all of these technologies can do for them so that they can educate their executives because it's a lot of pressure now there is price pressure you know the, the media and entertainment company didn't have the best year last year honestly because you know all the earning calls and the revenues going down and and all users sharing the passwords so that you know we, we won't pay for what we need to pay and things like that all that and spending millions and millions of dollars in content it's putting executives in all the companies in a very tough spot and then generative ai comes oh wow why don't we use this magic wand to cut all the cost for, for for localization right so as service provider what we want to do is to really be the um you know the go-to person the go-to trusted partner so that we can tell them okay where are we today when it comes to the technology what this really actually means for you because maybe it means nothing as the right. quality standards that you have today we cannot use the technology and, and magically solve everything uh, and what where is the technology going and what is needed to make the technology progress right so i think that is very important um and that is the conversations that we're having today with with our clients and from a technology perspective i'm sure that Eugenie can share something yeah. interesting well, really quick, I'll just jump in because I have a short attention span. I'll forget. But <laughs> we've been hearing, we've been seeing a lot here at NMC Insights because we've been working with companies too to kind of to get the C-suite off their back, essentially, right? Because you know we get a lot of these requests. Hey, you know my um, CMO, my CFO, whoever it is, has said that we need to implement this. What does that mean for our industry? What's realistic? What's not realistic? And how can I respond to them? Right. So we've seen a lot of that, and I, I've noticed um, that you know last year, last year was uh, at the face of it, it should have been a pretty boom year for a lot of um, LSPs for for the localization industry as well. But there was a lot of slowdown in investment, and my hypothesis is that it is based upon conversations I've had with enterprise clients is that there was a lot of hesitation to invest in technology until the dust settled a little bit until kind of people figured out what's fact what's fiction so that was just kind of my observations as well but interested to hear evgeny's thoughts yes exactly and just uh, from the technology point of view for the actual large language model this is the same uh, case that uh, there is uh, so much new things, uh, so many new things which come, and every day there is another large language models pop, pops up. Uh, they all have different uh, applications. Uh, they may be fine-tuned slightly differently, different sizes, and so on. And uh, we first need to see what works best. So at Aptek, we do use large language models right now, uh, but not for media and entertainment directly. Uh, what we have seen uh, is that these models are very helpful for uh, creating some kind of synthetic uh, training data for systems. Uh, so one of the things, for example, which I wanted to mention that we do is modeling of uh, speaker agenda, uh, because in many languages, uh, the uh, translation has some gender specific forms uh, of the words. It's not just about, you know, gender bias or professions and so on, which is important to alleviate, but it's just about language itself. So if you don't know who's speaking, it is sometimes very hard to get uh, the right language forms, like in Czech, uh, in many uh, Romance languages and other languages like that. Um, and basically, one way uh, to deal with that is, for example, you can take a uh, the sentence where it is spoken by male or female and say, uh, let's generate uh, something which a large language model, which is has the same content, basically change as little as possible, but make sure that this is uh, uh, then a male form or female form. So this is a, a way of uh, extending the training data with the examples you want to have uh, to alleviate gender bias or to have the different types of data for modeling this uh, gender, but also maybe some other uh, 
cases like uh, removal of disfluencies, you want you might want to do that with a large language model. Uh, and then uh, you stay in control because this is quite important that especially media localization that you have control of over what is happening. Yes, so you don't want to just say translate and then you have a very nice looking translation, but then as you read it, you notice, oh, it's very fluent and nice, but it actually uh, removed uh, some very important thing or, you know, changed the semantics slightly. And it is very hard to notice uh, because uh, you don't um, um, see that in this fluent uh, translation as, as well. Yeah. So this is uh, what I, I'm kind of still missing is the possibility to actually better control the large language models output, uh, how it it is done now with prompting with sometimes better, sometimes worse, but still there's like no guarantee that something will pop up uh, that it yeah. does not fit what you're trying to do. Yes. Uh, and maybe another example here is the constraints for subtitling, for example, that we have seen that uh, there are certain constraints and maximum number of characters per line, maximum uh, line length. And we have already before the emergence of models like uh, ChatGPT, we have already had uh, neural solutions for this, which are combined with hard constraints. So it's a special dedicated algorithm that makes sure that uh, the translation is done still on the full sentence level, that the previous context is considered during translation for better disambiguation of any uh, uh, polysemous words, for example, or pronouns. Uh, but then at the same time that the resulting translation is put into the subtitle template in the right way, that uh, these uh, constraints are respected, that it's readable, uh, readability constraints are also respected. And this is very difficult to do with a free form prompt or, you know, you, you cannot expect a, a large language model to do it well so far because we have seen examples that it cannot really count the characters right now. This is the typical thing that, you know, yeah. it's, it's bad at counting. You can tell, tell it counts the number of characters in this word, it will make an error uh, a lot of times. Uh, so that is why we are actively researching this. We're having models of our own for different tasks like summarization, extraction of information. Uh, we are experimenting also for translation uh, with these models. Um, there we face also the difficulty that the current models are very much English uh, prone, so to say, or very much good at English and the top languages, but not so good at lower resource languages, which are of great interest to uh, media localization. Uh, and this is another thing that we think the dedicated, a dedicated model where we uh, focus really on these languages uh, works better right now. But yes, uh, large language models, is, we keep a close eye on them and uh, we definitely will use them in the future. Yeah, and you know, that, that's all fascinating, you know, kind of getting a peek under the hood on what it is that you're working on, where, where it's currently working well, where it's not working well, where you're going to invest in more research and development. Um, question for Bellin, though. Um, so what? Right? Like what's the point how how does this translate into i mean and i'm i'm asking this question from your client's perspective mm -hmm. right yeah no absolutely Tucker. i think we're still in a in in a phase where we're still figuring out what are the real applications of the technology that will actually make a difference for our clients so we're starting to see some use cases that I, to me are quite uh, good because they mean more accessibility, right? So you probably, many people here know that the European Union has this accessibility act coming up next year, June 2025. And so most of our clients will be forced. I mean, they want to make their content accessible, but now there will be a regulation that actually will have uh, them to do this once and for all. So they will have to provide digital accessibility for all their content in all the languages in, in the European Union. <clears throat> that means, that will probably mean that they will have to have closed captions in in all languages because just for People might not be aware of this, but for example, in Spain, when I go to Netflix or to HBO Max or whatever platform, the subtitles that I receive in Spanish are just subtitles, meaning that they don't contain any 
audio sound event information. They are just the translation from the English subtitles. They are not closed captions in other languages, right? So right now, if I'm deaf in Spain and I want to watch something, I just need to use the subtitles that are in, in Spanish without all the sound and event information, which is a miss, right? I mean, it's not cool for people to not be able to access this information. And audio description, the same. Audio description is not available anywhere in, in European languages unless it's an original um series or movie from Spain, for example, if I go to and, and want to watch La Casa de Papel, Money Heist, yes, there, there will be an audio description in Spanish, but it won't be an audio description for any other any other show that is created outside Spain, which is a big miss, right? So I, I feel that with the technology that we are now going to polish and make it better for our use case. This is a very clear use case where we could use machine translation to localize the English audio description scripts and then TTS to generate the audio for, for the target languages, for example. Audio description uh, right now, the, the style in, in, the, in English and in other languages is kind of flat. So TTS, which is text-to-speech technology, is a very good candidate to to have this, uh, you know, this is a very good use case for this technology because it, it is there already to, to provide a flat voice that sounds good, that sounds nice and so on. For actually, we're already providing TTS audio description for some clients in the UK for many years because they wanted that. Okay. So even if I, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, quite quality is important and of course we care about quality and using technology doesn't mean that it's not going to be high quality but it will enable more content to be accessible which otherwise right. if we have to generate all these access services from scratch maybe clients won't be able to to have all this accessibility in their platforms and i see this as well like when you know, this technology is not to replace the, the, the human workflows that we have today, the traditional workflows that we have to, today, but to expand to other workflows and new right. things. And, and I'm also thinking about hyper-localization, for example, like right now, Spanish. Spanish, there are like, a, I don't know how many, 20 different variants of Spanish or more, no? And today we have to, it's either Castilian Spanish or it's, uh, Mexican neutral Spanish for most of the content, yeah, right? Spanish, so, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, what if we can, you know, add more regional variants with the technology, thanks to the technology? What if we can conform a, you know, Castilian Spanish uh, subtitle into other variants and, and then let uh, the users decide which one they want to, to use? Or for TTS, what if we want to have audio description with different accents because you know we want to give people in in colombia ad in colombian accent and things like that or even things like i've been hearing this for from many people who are not in the media and entertainment localization industry is that users are very annoyed when they turn on the subtitles in the platforms this imagine the spanish subtitles but they want to watch the spanish dubs and then the dubbing script and the subtitles, they don't match. I've noticed they, that, like yeah, when I'm watching. Right. And, I, you know, I've always wanted to ask you, Belen, about this. Well, always, like for the last couple of years, ever since you abandoned Nimsy to go work for <laughs> Deluxe. I've always wanted to ask this, like, why is that? I'm sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent. Why, why do yeah. the subtitles, like if I turn on Spanish dubbing and then turn on Spanish subtitles, or hell, if I turn on English subtitles sometimes it doesn't match why why is that yeah because this those are two different products two different deliverables two different people working on on that and 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 so that is how it is so when when you're subtitle when you're translating subtitles to be used as subtitles that in theory in in, in the client's minds these subtitles are going to be used with the original language right ah, and then you have the subtitles okay. which is a translation from the original language right so you will have solutions that are you know more like close to the original script because you are listening to the original and you're reading so you don't want to be super extremely creative and change many things like cultural reference and things like that because the audience will listen and will say hey these guys are not translating well they are changing everything and now this is wrong right so this is is a translation from the original script, from the original audio. The dubbing is 
created for dubbing purposes and they might have different solutions because you don't have access to the original, right? So I might have more creative choices and say that I will change uh, a cultural reference, for example. I remember I always put this example to my students when, when I was teaching from friends. There is a, an episode when Phoebe is giving birth to the triplets from her brother, uh, that she's in the hospital and there is this doctor and he's kind of crazy and he's making all these references to the fonts, uh, which is, you know, from a TV show in the United States, I think it was Happy Days, that, you know, was not, uh, and it's not very popular in Spain, right? So in the subtitles, you will keep the reference to the fonts because if you change that, well, maybe people would feel like, okay, this is somehow off. But in the dubbing, all those references were changed to Star Trek and Captain Spock, ah, okay. which was more relatable for the audience in, in, in Spain, right? So I think that this is a good example to show some of the differences, some of the limitations like from a creative side that you have in the different uh, modalities, dubbing and subtitling, and why subtitles don't match the dubbing, because it's like two different products, and it's not supposed to be watched together. Sorry, people. But you now can do it because you have access to all these streaming platforms and you have more options. But now people are complaining because of that. So why don't we use technology to transcribe the, the dubbing script in, 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 in the target languages and then people can select, do you want the subtitles to be watched with the English? Do you want the subtitles to be watched with, with the dubbing? And so you, you give more opportunity to people to customize their experience. I think those would be some use cases that are nice where technology can be used. And of course, expanding to new verticals or new customer base that is not core for Deluxe. Like now we, we serve media and entertainment, but there are other use cases more on the broadcasting side, more on the sports side, that they have more even life uh, transcription and translation mm -hmm. needs. And for that, we totally need technology to yeah. be more efficient and more accurate and so on and so forth. So there are many things where like this might mean opportunities for our clients beyond just, you know, okay, now we have MTP workflows. Congrats. Right? Yeah. Like that is not exciting, but there are so many other applications where we can see that. Yeah. And, and Aptek has had quite an experience already with uh, live uh, recognition. Uh, with captioning uh, for many news studios, uh, our captioning, uh, live captioning solution was used already. We have also experience uh, with translation uh, and live uh, captioning, so also live translation. And we also had several clients where uh, there was like a transcript and translation of the show necessary to be ready within one or two hours with some post-editing. Uh, and we were able to provide very good uh, customized systems uh, which require only little changes so that this requirement could be uh, met. Um, so this is uh, one area. Uh, and as for the uh, you know core deluxe workflows, I also like to say that we uh, try to eliminate the boring, tedious work on the more easy things and leave time to the translator to focus yeah. on the more creative aspects of the work on the translation of wordplay, for example, some puns, some uh, historical references, maybe so something uh, like what Belen just said, where it requires actually a really deep understanding and maybe a rephrasing completely with a different um, different example uh, and not just literally translating uh, and uh, of course uh, MT uh, right now is not able to do that usually yes unless it just mm -hmm. memorize some kind of uh, you know proverb translation or whatever uh, but uh, uh, the other stuff uh, it can do quite well you know some simple dialogue or in documentaries MT does very, very well because uh, it's, uh, you know, what's out there, the news events and so on, this is all very much learned by the model. And um, um, also any any other kind of like more repetitive uh, content, uh, it is translating that w quite well. Yeah? yeah. And this is uh, what we try to also make sure that is uh, translated not just well, but consistently. This is one of the problems I, I mentioned, kind of this, to have some control with large language models difficult but just with neural MT it can also be difficult yeah. and that's why we look at 
making sure that the glossary terms are translated correctly it's it's a difficult task for neural mt it's not just you know passing it to the target side it has to be in the right context it has to be in the right morphological form and you have to make sure that it's actually used consistently throughout the whole file uh, and the other point is um, yeah also uh, the uh, fika agenda so if you can get this information uh, from a human uh, subtitle template let's say you can we utilize it if you don't have this information we can also try to get it with our speech recognition technology based on the acoustic voice characteristics and then if we set this information and pass it on to the mt system that is trained in a way to actually use this information mm -hmm. for the right word forms then you don't have this repetitive corrections of uh, you know it's a not male but female speaking you need to change all yeah. the suffixes of the words and whatever uh, and this creates a better experience for the people so they actually see oh the, i don't have to, to correct much here uh, it's all consistent so i really read it carefully yes there may be a few errors here and there and here's a bigger chunk where which is really requires creative work and this is what i'm going to focus on so this is my goal and we actually see already some first results where we see like really people say oh this is actually helpful for me yes and, yeah and 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 we get the feedback as, as Belen said earlier today and we also continue continue improving uh, on our side from this feedback so this is this type of cooperation is really what i like is that we actually see what makes a difference and what does not make a difference maybe as much yeah. uh, and then we can improve our technology in, in the right way yeah, and you've, you've talked a lot about a lot of different technologies. We've talked about neural machine translation. We've talked about text-to-speech, speech-to-text, speech-to-speech, um, you know, gender recognition, you know, all of these different forms of AI technology, generative AI, large language models, all of this stuff. And, you know, just to reiterate something that you've both said, but to reiterate, because it's an important point, is, you know, this... The use cases that folks like us are most excited about aren't replacing translators, but they're rather enable, using technology to enable hyper-localization, basically in order to do things that were, no, were not cost-efficient to do earlier, right? Or impossible to do earlier. Live transcription and translation of broadcast media for example, is a great case study. It's like, that's just not feasible to have live translation of, of live broadcast media out there without the use of technology. And um, Belen, down in your neck of the woods, well, I guess you're in Spain, but you know, down in um, Hollywood, there's been some, there's been some stuff happening in the last year, right? With the writer's mm -hmm. strikes and everything. And I'm certainly no expert in that space. But I do recall hearing that one of the points of contention, let's say, from the Actors Guild um, and the writers too, probably, is the use of AI. So people mm -hmm. are concerned about, writers are being concerned about using AI to replace them. Actors are concerned about using AI to replicate their voices or likenesses without their consent. Um, all of that stuff. And, you know, I'm saying all this to kind of lead into the question that I think we could probably spend the rest of our time on today, which is <clears throat> how long until the humans replace us or until the machines replace us humans, right? No, I mean, no, but seriously, yeah. you know, what are your thoughts? Open question. Talk amongst yeah. yourselves. Yeah, that's a, a great question, Tucker. I mean, first of all, I want to say that me personally, I feel like we are, as a service provider, we are no one with our, our creative partners. We are no one with our translators. We have no, no one with our, with our voice talent. We are no one. Like, really, it's in, in, in our best interest to take care of the creative talent that works for us today and will continue to work with us for the foreseeable future because really we are no one without them. And I, I want to make this very, very clear. Uh, because this is the stance at Deluxe, and we really understand that. The same as Hollywood doesn't want to get rid of the talent and be and you know have all the scripts now created with ChatGPT because life will be very boring and we will be very depressed after very few time. So that that being said, um, 
Yeah, I don't think, I mean, yesterday I was listening at the podcast with uh, Bill Gates and Sa Sam Oldman. I, I really, I really recommend you to, to listen to that one. It's very recent. It's, it's unconfused me with Bill Gates podcast. And um, one of the main kind of fears that Sam Almond was voicing, which wasn't making me less nervous about this, is that um, first of all, that he thinks that this new revolution, this new technology revolution is different from the previous ones, is different from um, the internet revolution or the computer invention revolution for what matters, because you know, it took like a couple of generations to adapt to these technology shifts. And it was all right, right? Because when I was uh, little, I didn't have internet at home, even if internet existed, right? But we were poor, so we didn't have access to that. And it took some time for companies to do those shifts and for people had time to learn how to use this technology, how it will impact their work and so on and so forth. Sam Altman's um, concern is that this revolution or this AI revolution will be way faster and how society will adapt to it will be uh, one of the main challenges that we have ahead of us. That's one thing. The other thing that kind of concerned me uh, hearing from Sam Alman was that Biggs made a very good uh, question asking, but how about human purpose? which I think it's a very important ethical question that we should be asking ourselves uh, because uh, it was asking, like, I'm really interested in, 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 like, curing malaria in Africa. And now we, like, generative AI come up with a solution, and then I have nothing to do because, you know, this will already be done. And Sam Altman said, you know, that he was also kind of troubled or concerned about that because he feels that this is the last thing that he is going to solve or he is going to make an effort to solve. And after solving generative AI, he will um you know the generative ai the artificial intelligence will be smarter than him so he will have no like really nothing to do about that so that got me thinking um and you know we cannot turn our backs to the reality of technology from a language service provider perspective i don't see like today i my little brain cannot imagine that future where all humans are replaced by generative AI and technology. I cannot imagine today. But listening to these guys who are actually working on that technology, well, that's kind of, I don't know. I, I don't have a, 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 like a magic crystal ball to, to, to tell people, yes, don't worry, everything is going to be fine. I wish I had, but this is what these guys are talking about. So I think we need to be cautious a lot on, on our side. For me personally, I don't see humans at least on the creative side of things being replaced in the foreseeable uh, future not not because the machine won't be able to do it i think the, mach the machine might be able to do it in five ten years i don't know but do we as humans will want to consume stuff that is fully created by a machine will be able to connect with that content, with those stories, with, with with those words, with those voices that are not human. Not for Game of Thrones, <laughs> right? Maybe, I mean, maybe for like tutorials or, you know, it's like one thing, I, I think public perception, societal expectations around synthetic voices have shifted. So like there's two things happening. One, <clears throat> synthetic voices are getting, and I'm just using synthetic voices as an example. Synthetic voices are getting better and more human-like, right? But at the same time, our expectations are coming down to, to meet it. Like if you go on TikTok, you know, mm. if, if you're braver than me, and you go on TikTok, a lot of, you know, TikTok reels, whatever they're called, um, use synthetic voices. And so I think public perception around it is getting more accepting of it however i not for i wouldn't want to watch star wars using synthetic voices right and it, it's kind of like it, it and there's studies out there by smarter people than me that, that could cite these studies but your brain gets tired after mm -hmm. listening to synthetic voices for more than a minute or two right so it just kind of creates a brain drain yeah i mean Personally, I don't think that 
in creative workflows we like humans will and you're talking about the like a very open question right i'm yeah. not even talking about deluxe or about I'm, I'm just talking about from an ethical human challenge perspective yeah, yeah, where yeah. we are and i'm listening to the guys who are leading the way to, to kind of get some sense of how they are feeling about this um so personally i don't even if the technology would be great in five years even if tts technology would be great in five years and it will sound like Exactly like a human, will we want to like really consume so. things that are absolutely just computer generated, or can we leverage technology to really increase accessibility, increase right. hyper localization? I mean, it's the same with when Google Translate was invented, right? Like, I don't think Google Translate, and this is something that Renato says a lot, and I, I learned from him, like Google Translate didn't like sent all LSPs to bankruptcy. On the contrary, now when I'm like I'm doing something and I see something in a language that I don't know, I just go to Google Translate and translate it just to get the gist of it. Or if I go to a website in Japanese that I have no idea what it's about, I can just use Google Translate and it's and, providing and me with realistic accessibility. Yeah, when you do that, you're not stealing a job from a translator. Exactly. Because it's not like you would have hired a translator to do exactly. that anyways. Yeah. And, and the videos on YouTube, they also have automatic generated subtitles on, on TikTok or any other social media. All these guys, they have the, all these automatic generated subtitles, TTS, whatever. But that's content that that was not going to be localized in the first place. Right. So why why don't give the power to the users and really use the technology well, where it will add value to humanity, not to anyone else, right? Like, that's what I think, but... Well, maybe has well put, beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really agree with both of you, and uh, I was never one of the people who would say that the singularity or the emergence of uh, general AI would be very soon. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but uh, also I see now there's a lot of research on how to detect stuff generated by AI. Uh, with AI again, but uh, it shows that, uh, you know, people actually would like to know what is by human, uh, you know, was that was produced by humans and what was uh, created by AI, yes, so, uh, and it means that makes a difference still for people, yes, and as long as this is the case, uh, the, the best way to use the technology is really to assist people, as, as you said, yes, and this is what I think is is good and we also see for example that mt uh, sometimes just provides suggestions for translation which uh, people not necessarily use maybe they like something better but they say oh sometimes they say oh this is a word i kind of forgot or it was in my passive memory but not so in active memory it might be a good translation or maybe like a similar word now i remember which can be a good translation and so on so there's a lot of uh, this uh, supporting uh, work uh, tedious work of you know looking up a word in the dictionary like it was in the old days you don't necessarily have to do it anymore yes uh, and um, removing this uh, tediousness making it uh, fun to work with language I think this is a great thing that uh, the new uh, technology is doing. And yes, uh, chat GPT or models like that are quite creative. But they are also like, as I said, not so much controllable in this creativity. And uh, yeah, it, it is more like you can only, uh, if, if you specify something specific, you know, you just, I, I want, uh, you know, a, a poem about this or a, a line about that, then they do a good job. Yeah? Yeah. So you have to provide some feedback or some control. You cannot just say, you know, go, go and give me, you know, some uh, new, new movie. Yes, yeah? so you have to specify a lot of things to actually make it work uh, quite well. Yeah, so uh, that's why I think the technology is there to stay, but it will hopefully be a, a useful tool for people. And then people, yeah, as you said, will try to also use it to create more content, to localize more content, uh, and uh, yeah, so people will still have their jobs, and maybe there will be more uh, fun jobs. Yeah, I'm all right there with you. This technology ain't going to replace people. It's only going to replace people that are afraid to use the new technology. It's actually going to make our, our, and I say our, um, it's going to make our jobs um, more interesting.
right? Because who wants, I don't want a job that can be done by a machine, right? I don't want a repetitive, boring, lame job. I want a job where I get to think and be creative and stuff like that. All of the things that machines are bad at, that, that's kind of what I want to be doing. But that's just me. So, well, um, we're coming up on the hour here, um, folks. Any closing thoughts before I start wrapping us up today? Uh, yeah, I think I said everything that uh, I'm thinking about right now with no filters, but yeah, just uh, that we're really looking forward to see what we can do in combination with service providers, language technology providers, our clients, the, the, the talent that works with us and all the stakeholders that are in, in this amazing industry that we work for. And I, I think we can really achieve really cool things and make a good in the world and not the other way around. Oh, I've always loved that about you, Bellin. You're so optimistic. You're young still. Don't worry. Life will beat that out of you. No. <laughs> uh, Evgeny. Yeah, I, I since uh, Tucker, you mentioned TTS earlier, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, this whole pipeline of what we create right now at Aptic uh, called, let's say, let's call it voiceover, not really dubbing because we are not, you know, fitting the lips or anything. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed myself by the quality of the voices, right? Right. but I also still see some uh, room for improvement there. Yes. And again, uh, there's several possibilities we identified where there could be human intervention starting from fixing speech recognition errors all the way up to actually setting the tone of the voice uh, uh, for the actual generation of the voice but also things like just properly saying the names uh, which are foreign names possibly uh, in uh, in the speech in the target language yes which is not you you would expect from a system but re really it ruins your experience when this is happening that the name is not pronounced the right way you immediately know that this is not uh, a human voice yes oh, oh but I, fix... hey I, even i make that mistake yeah i can't tell <laughs> <Yes>. you <laughs> i always need to remind okay, myself but... before you start yeah, the podcast I mean, sound uh, <laughs> na as a native speaker of that language but, uh, or the, this voice the yeah, yeah. voice sound yeah so uh, you would expect usually and then you you hear this error and you see oh my god this is not the right thing to do yes but once you make this intervention in in between and also maybe some creative intervention to actually uh you know make the utterance fit the, the at least the duration uh and you know fit the purpose of, of this um you know, not, not, not be so boring let's say like in some translations then you actually can create a great experience with a limited amount of time so it's, it does not right. co cost you as much time as really having a full dubbing setup uh, there and especially with, with the voice you 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 actually get gain from having these voices and yes then you can expand this offering to a lot of new content which you could not have dubbed or voiced or made voiceover before yeah so and i find this is a perfect example of all the technologies coming together and all the different ways of how uh, yeah humans are involved in uh, in the localization of dubbing process coming together and and uh, this is what i'm also looking for forward to uh, for the future lots of optimism lots of reasons to be optimistic i would say yeah. sometimes we just need to remember that so belen Evgeny, thank you so much for scheduling this and coming on the show i'm i'm gonna take us out here uh ladies gentlemen chat we are out of time for today if you enjoyed this nimsy live experience then join us uh Next week, you can go over to our LinkedIn page here at NIMSY Insights and go down to upcoming events. We have on Monday, March 25th, AI for Translation and Interpretation. Um, that's going to be a good one. 234 people already signed up. 84 people signed up for the one today, but at one point we had more than 84 people joining us. So it's one of those where people saw us live and they wanted to come on in so if that if you're one of those people welcome make sure that you're subscribing to nimsy insights or following us on linkedin so that you get notified of our future episodes i appreciate our guests today belen and evgeny i appreciate my colleagues here at nimsy insights doing all the hard work so i can have these interesting conversations and finally i appreciate you the audience who are joining us live today and i look forward to next time cheers <laughs>